Good afternoon to all of you, and I want to thank the Press Club for allowing us to be here today for uh, this opportunity for you to hear from candidates in this uh, Senate race. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and a great-grandmother. I'm an educator, and I'm also a former school board member. I've served in the legislature now for 12 years, term limited out, and I'm running now for Senate District 14. During the 12 years that I've been on the, in the legislature, I have passed numerous bills. I've passed over 50 bills and co-sponsored over 300 bills. So it's important to know that I've been very busy while I've been in the legislature, and some of the things that I had, pas had passions for are education, and of course, since I'm a former educator, education, early childhood in particular, and was so pleased that the governor passed uh, the money for the early childhood program this past time, and the teacher raises. But I have been a staunch supporter of the people of the state of Louisiana for the past 12 years, and my reason for running is to be able to go on to the Senate to do some of the very good things that I've done since I've been in the House. I'd also like to tell you about the one bill in particular that is so memorable for, even for today. Uh, we had a gentleman vote today for the first time in 36 <coughs> years. The felons voting bill that I passed in 2018 allowed felons who've been out of prison for five years to be able to get their right to vote back, and they got that back on March 1st of this year. So a very memorable day for Mr. Chico Yancey, and I have to mention his name because he was the face of the bill. I do want to say that I'm running for the Senate to continue doing the good work I've done, but also to continue being a senator for the people, because I am packed for the people. And I want you to know that I will continue to do that as a senator for District 14. Well, first of all, good afternoon. And let me uh, thank the Baton Rouge Press Club for having this, uh, this forum this morning. Uh, before I make my opening remarks, I would like to, I just learned from Will just a few minutes ago, that a former colleague of mine uh, was killed on yesterday, Chloe Fontenot. I served with Chloe, and uh, if you would just um, bear with me, and if we can just take a brief moment of silence and pray for his, his family. Amen. Thank you very much. My name is Cleo Fields. Um, I graduated from McKinley Senior High School here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In 1980, when I graduated from McKinley, I went to Southern University. I became freshman class president at Southern. Uh, my senior year at Southern University, I was a student body president, and I also served on the Louisiana Board of Regents as a student member. When I graduated from Southern University, I decided to go to law school. I graduated from law school in 1987. I decided to run for the state senate uh, at 24 years of age. I was elected to the state senate and became the youngest one in the country. Served in the state senate for five years and then went on to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I want to put a peg there because when I was elected to the House of Representatives, one of the big issues that I ran on, and that was education. And when I entered the U.S. Congress, I wanted to be a part of the Education Caucus. And I learned there was no caucus for education. So I got with Senator Wellstone on the Senate side, and we started the Caucus for Education. Uh, I say that not to brag. I say it because it's a doggone shame that in 1993, we didn't have a caucus for education in the United States House of Representatives. I'm running for the state senate. I appreciate uh, the people in Baton Rouge uh, vote and support. I'm number 64 on the ballot, and thank you very much for having me. The question is asking my relationship with the governor and how it would, I would continue that relationship. Uh, John Bell Edwards and I were elected to the legislature at the very same time, 2007, and we s both served on the Education Committee together, and we were both very staunch supporters of those bills that we knew were great for teachers and for students in uh, education. So I've worked with him uh, in, in education on uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, when he was elected governor, I supported him during his first term as uh, elected governor, being elected as governor. I will continue to support him as uh, the elected governor when he's elected for the next four years. Mr. Fields, the question to Ms. Smith was about her relationship with the current governor. If you could answer that for you, please. Well, I have, um, I know the, the governor of the state of Louisiana. 
I've worked with him uh, not as a legislator, but I worked with him as a as a lawyer. Uh, that was a time that was not a single African American on the Board of Regents at a very crucial time in this state when there was a move to merge Southern University and UNO, Southern University in New Orleans. Uh, I worked with the governor, and to his credit, I mean, he worked very hard to make sure that uh, uh, that didn't happen. I filed a lawsuit, quite frankly, uh, to keep it from happening, and, uh, and Bobby Jindal ended up putting an African American as a result. Uh, I'm going to work with whomever the governor is because I just think in this state we got to have coalition building. We got to have people who bring people together for the better good of the state of Louisiana and all of its citizens. I would have an excellent, excellent relationship with Mr. Uh, Edwards, uh, and, but I would work with whomever is elected governor. Yes, Robert. Robert Burns, South Louisiana. Um, there have been, in the last two legislative sessions, initiatives to exempt certain occupational uh, from having occupational licensing, most of the most high profile of which has been hair braiding. Uh, the Institute for Justice recently sued the State Board of Cosmetology over what they need to be overly restrictive requirements, 500 hours. Uh, we need your I question, know, please. I'm going to get the question. I'm going to get the question. I'd like to know how each of you would view an, another bill that were introduced for the hair braiding and also specifically to Representative Smith, can you explain why you voted against the last bill sponsored by Representative Julie Emerson, which Governor Edwards did actively support? I think we should not only deal with, you know, there's too many, you know, I've, and I've been fighting this since I was in the legislature years ago, there are just too many requirements, too many uh, requirements in terms of license for boards that, that uh, and for professions rather that, that just don't need. I mean, it's just a lot of bureaucracy. Hair braiding, absolutely, I would support the legislation. Uh, Co-sponsor the legislation, um, and, and if need be, I author the legislation. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, there are some things in Louisiana we ought not have to have a license to do. Uh, it's just too much bureaucracy, uh, and, and I'm amenable, but if you look at my track record, I've actually voted in that respect. Interesting you should ask that question. I co-sponsored the bill the very first year that Ms. Emerson brought that bill. The second year when she brought it back, I believe that what happened on that bill is there was not enough communication between the legislature and or Ms. Emerson and the Board of Cosmetology because a compromise has to be made on that particular bill. The, that hair braiding falls under cosmetology. They want to require 500 hours. I think there's a way to compromise on that bill, so I didn't vote for it the second time because I don't think we did enough research to make sure that that compromise came about. And I, I do feel that, of course, I sponsored one of the first occupational licenses for the barbers uh, to be able to get uh, young people who are felons to be able to get barber license. So I'm for looking at how we can make sure that people get opportunities for jobs, and I think that's important. Cleo, I know you say your official residence is on Hollywood. People insist to me that as a practical matter, you live in your house day in and day out on Highland Park. Can, can you address that and give me a general idea how much time you spend at Highland Park, say in a typical month, versus how much time you spend at your house? Well, first let me answer how much time, as much as I want to, because I own it. But let me, uh, let me address this issue because I've heard some talk about it. You know, there's one constitution in this state, and there's one set of rules and regulations, and I have the right to, be, be, to, uh, to live and operate under those rules and regulations. Uh, my domicile is 5347 Hollywood Street. It's been my domicile for 30 some years. Don't have any plans of changing it, will not change it, and if anybody had any doubt about where I'm domiciled, there is a mechanism. You can file a lawsuit. We had more candidates challenged across this state than ever before. You know, I don't know why I wasn't challenged because I was looking forward to the challenge because my domicile is 5347 Hollywood. Uh, do I own other properties? Yes, the Constitution and the law of the state gives me the right to do that. Uh, but I'm not going to change my domicile uh, and I don't plan to change it ever. Uh, Thank you for the question. 
Ms. Smith, there was a question about uh, domicile in this race. Do you want to speak to it at all? I think the article that was in the paper speaks to the issues that we brought forward on the residency and domicile. And I think the most important thing is that while the law provides you the opportunity to have a homestead exemption on a particular house uh, and to be able to vote there, it's a loophole in the law. And I think it's important that when you do want to run for office that you should live with the people that you want to uh, represent. Should the legislature be in charge of redistricting and what should that process look like if so in 2020? Loophole with the law. There's no loophole in the law as it relates to domicile. Um, and so I wanted to be very clear. That's why I know the lawsuit was filed. Now, in terms of redistricting, you know, I've served, you know, I guess twice at, uh, when we had to deal with redistricting in the state. There are some people who are of the opinion that we should leave it to a private commission uh, to do redistricting. Others feel that we ought to leave it uh, with the legislature. You know, my attitude is, you know, we have, to, we have to know that you can't take the politics out of politics. I mean, redistricting is a very messy process. You know, the politicians basically decide what lines and where they're going to go and uh, who's going to be affected. I do think when I was chairman of Senate and Governmental Affairs, one of the things I did, and if folk in this room can attest to it, I made sure that we took a road trip all across the state and had public hearings so people who were affected, which were all the people in Louisiana, had some input in that process. And I think we should do it again. I heard this question asked of the governors, and every last one of them said that they should leave it to the legislature. We've done redistricting, and I've had an opportunity to do the 2010 redistricting as well. Uh, so that's uh, at least gives me an uh, upper hand as well of being able to go into the Senate to be able to redistrict. Of course, they redistrict different uh, uh, Senate judges and what have you. But I do think that the legislature can do it in, a, in the right way because it's so important to look at how you balance districts to be able to get individuals to have the right to vote for a person that they choose to vote for. It's so important as well that the legislature look at this in a very, uh, very mindful manner since all the new laws have come out regarding redistricting. But I would prefer to see the legislature do it. And I don't know if you recall, but Bobby Jindal made a comment the last time we redistricted, and especially in the Senate, that if a bill was brought to him that he did not like, he would veto it immediately. I don't think that we would have that problem if we were able to do that in a balanced manner. I would like to ask you each a question. Each of you have had the opportunity to serve in the state legislature, and of course, Mr. Fields, you served in uh, Congress. Can you share with us today what you think your most significant action in, the, in that capacity has been in your career? Most significant uh, was working with the colleges and universities in my district. Um, before every legislative session, one of the things I did, I met with the uh, president at uh, Southern University and the president of LSU. And now Baton Rouge Community College is a part of the 14th Senatorial District as well. I've always considered the 14th District as the hub for higher education in this state. And so I pride myself on the fact that every budget that was introduced by the, by the governor of the state, no matter if it was a Democratic governor or a Republican governor, uh, I was able to get additional funds for both LSU and Southern and make sure that higher education, at least in the 14th district, uh, had a fair shake. And I'm going to do the same thing, including Baton Rouge Community College. Last 15 seconds, also in Congress. I mean, I started the Education Caucus, you know, uh, because, you know, you got, you know, 435 members of the House and they have caucuses for everything, black caucus, Hispanic caucus, and didn't have an education caucus. So that would be my, those would be my pride, you know, issues that I dealt with. I have a number of them, and I'm going to probably give you a couple of them. But uh, one, while I heard uh, Mr. Fields talk about the merger of Southern University and UNO, uh, I stood the ground 
and on the front page of the paper showed me holding the line with Jim Tucker not being able to bring that bill to the floor for a vote. So as the chair of the Black Caucus, that was something that I feel very proud about, that Southern University did not lose its status as, a, as the only HBCU system in the country. But I think my criminal justice bills as well uh, would be very satisfying for uh, individuals in the state of Louisiana because it crosses the spectrum of how we've been able to deal with mass incarceration in our state uh, in creating bills not only for the men, but are looking at the task force we put together for women. And early childhood definitely is something else that I'm extremely proud of because I passed the only early childhood bill for the deaf children in the state of Louisiana. I think the question is uh, from an outdoorsman. He wants to know about your views on water use and uh, diversions and that sort that it has, as it may relate to uh, outdoor activity and outdoor sportsmanship. Ms. Smith. This was indeed an interesting conversation that went on in the legislature because when you talk about right away in the water, we had to figure out where in the world does the line stop? You know, because folks were saying their land went out into the water, but no one could tell us. So I'm very pleased that the governor has put a, a task force together to provide recommendations to the legislature to be able to come up with some uh, great ideas on how we ch challenge and work through this issue. Because you're right, diversions, uh, the Div Com Com diversion canal, you're talking about also all the silt that we have, and also, and, and just the idea of the right-of-ways and who owns those right-of-ways. We, we can't deal with that. I think that's really a court issue, so I think the legislature really has to come up with some recommendations on that. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. Whatever issues, one of the things I try to pride myself on and that is getting bringing people together to discuss problems and then forcing them to make good solutions and many times both sides leave you know unhappy but at the end of the day Louisiana moves forward uh, when I was in the legislature we had a big fight between the commercial fishermen and the uh, recreational fishermen and one of the things we had to do was pull both of those sides together so I'm willing to work with uh, you know property owners to make sure that uh, uh, they're not a adversely affected in an unfair way to make sure that uh, land use and uh, water right of ways are, are, are respected. Um, so I'm looking forward, you know, if you liked it, working with you and uh, all parties that are concerned. Ms. Courtney. So both of you are supporters of public education, K-12 education. Um, I'm wondering what your reactions are to charter schools, expansion of charter schools, one thing. And the other is, do you think the MFP should be dealt with at all? Should we look at the, how we fund K-12 education? Okay. We'll begin with Mr. Fields. Again, uh, your comments on K-12 education and also your comment on charter schools. Well, let me take charter schools first. Look, I've said, and you know, I've been very clear on it. You know, I'm not pro uh, any schools, be they charter, public, or private. I'm, ch I'm pro children and education. I think we've spent too much time in this state choosing one group after the, uh, against the other, uh, pitting one against the other, and then at the end of the day, little Tyrone, who's trapped in a school because of his zip code, can't get educated. That time in Louisiana must stop, and it must stop right now. Uh, I'm going to fight for good schools, you know, and I don't want kids and parents to be trapped in failing schools just because of where they live. And uh, so I'm going to fight hard for that, Courtney. And uh, it is, it's not pro or against, you know, public education or charter schools. It's about being pro education for children. Do you think the MFP should be? Yes, and I think the money should follow the kid, quite frankly. Uh, now, in terms of how much, you know, I'm always fighting for more, you know, MFP dollars because I just think there's nothing more important we can do in this state than educate our children. Nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Thank you. I'm going to start with the MFP. Uh, it does concern me of opening up the MFP because if you begin to open up the MFP, as some of our my colleagues had determined they wanted to do, 
uh, it would mean that school systems would be coming to the legislature to beg for money. Uh, and I think that's so unfortunate that we would have that issue come up that way. The MFP can be tweaked as the formula is looked at, but I do believe that it's important that we do keep funding for education on the rise because it's very important that we continue to fund our schools, which we're not funding to the fullest at this point in time. But we need, need to continue to put funds in, and I'm glad the governor put $40 million in the MFP this past session. But as far as charters are concerned, my issue with the, uh, the charter program, as I have always said, is the law. The charter law, when it was first put into place, stated that it was a, an experimental laboratory uh, pr program for in innovative learning that should be replicated in our traditional schools. That has not happened since charters have been in place. And that's what I'd like to see happen. Yes, Robert. Given that, the state, <coughs> given that the state is running a half a billion dollar surplus now, would, would either of you be in support of, given that the sales taxes are typically we deem aggressive, would either of you be in support of Lance Harris's intent to bring a bill that would scale these sales tax increases back much faster than they're ready to scale the to roll down? I'm gonna look at it from a hobo, uh, ho uh, holistic perspective. Uh, first of all, sales tax are regressive. I mean, they're the very, they're the most regressive stack, uh, taxes we have in the state and in the country. And Louisiana has uh, the highest state sales tax, uh, certainly in this region, and maybe in the country. So I would absolutely look to bring those sales tax down. And uh, uh, but I want to look at budget, budget. Uh, 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 as a whole first. You know, I'm not going to stand here today and say I'm going to do it absolutely and not looking at what kind of uh, problems it may have on the budget in the future. But I do agree with you, we, we have to be more uh, consistent with passing taxes that are more progressive and less taxes that are regressive like the sales tax. In 2008, after we took our oath of office, we recognized that we had a $2 billion surplus. And in 2000, by 2010, it was gone. So when you begin to talk about surpluses and what you do with the money, it's very important to recognize when you do something on one end, you may affect something on the other end. So by taking away and looking at the bill that Lance has brought, is, tried to even bring last time, of re re reducing or doing away with the 4.5, uh, sales tax. I think it's important to look at true tax reform. I think we need to have true tax reform in our state and we do need to develop a mechanism on how to do that rather than taking away something that we don't know in the long run whether or not we would need it and it was put in place for a certain period of time and it will go away after a certain period of time. So I think that's important that we look at how that budget is crafted, but true tax reform is extremely important in Louisiana. Patricia, again, um, some of your comments during the campaign about character and integrity have indicated that that's one thing that separates you from Cleo. Can you, can you comment on that? I use those terms of character and integrity uh, quite often in, in my, my campaign speeches because I have integrity. I think in the uh, legislature you can talk to anyone there that tells you that I have a word. If I have a word, that word is going to be that I can do something or if I can't do it, I will not, I will come back to you and tell you that I can't do it. But the most important thing is that I've, I have respect in the legislature by many of my colleagues who work, work together with uh, in the legislature. I've been told that you know we work together on various bills that are important to the citizens of Louisiana. Uh, I've never sold my people out. I will never sell my people out. I never will make a compromise on something that I feel is going to impact the people that I represent in the long run. And I think that's so very important because the people are the folks who put you there and they're the people that you want to represent and ensure that they get the best that you can give them while you're serving. If I could follow up, in your opinion, does Cleo have integrity or character issues that, that voters need to take into consideration in deciding who to vote for? Well, I think that the whole idea of looking at candidates is what they've done what they've been doing and how they have reacted uh, in the public as well as reacted to people. And Mr. Fields, if 
I, I'm sure he's going to comment on this. I'm not going to say whether he has a character flaw or whether he has integrity flaw, but I think it's important that he also determines whether or not deals that he makes with individuals are not going to impact the people that we represent. That's going to be his answer for you to give. I don't know how to answer the question because it was to, to Representative Smith, uh, but um, certainly the representative would not question my character or credibility because the last three times she ran for state representative, she sought my support and I supported her. Um, so, you know, look, character and integrity matters. There's no question about it. And working for the best interests of the people of this state and of the district in which you represent matters. Uh, and that's what I've done, you know. Uh, for the past, you know, five, first five years I served in the state senate, and then the four years I served in the U.S. House of Representatives, and then the ten years, the two and a half terms that a lot of people know about in the state senate again. You know, I was pleased to support uh, Representative Smith when she ran for the House of Representatives, uh, and, and I'm glad she sought my endorsement. Uh, but let's be very, very clear. And, you know, people in this district have elected me three times, uh, and they have not questioned my character. Uh, and if they did, they have concluded that I was of good and moral character, and I've served the people of this state at least three times. Well, I think the question is how would uh, voters, how should voters look at? Uh, a meeting I had with the governor uh, as, it relates to the FBI investigation. as it relates to it. I think they should look at it very carefully because quite frankly you know the voters have looked at it at least three times I've been on the ballot and they have concluded uh, that I was worthy of the opportunity to go back to the state senate and I thank them for that. But let's be very clear you know my opponent takes a lot of shots at me you know, all the time. You find me a man or a woman or a child who hasn't made a mistake, you just found somebody who hadn't done anything. Am I a perfect servant? No. You know, I'm a public servant. Did I do anything illegal or wrong? Absolutely not. But don't take my word for it. Take the people who do the investigation. Take the FBI word for it. Take the Justice Department's word for it. If I had done something wrong or illegal, they would have indicted me. They didn't. You know why? Not because they were doing me some favor. They did, did not, because I didn't do anything wrong. Secondly, don't, you know, you need to be mindful. When I get these attacks from my opponent, be mindful of the fact I was a private citizen. But I'm not using it as an excuse. But I was a private citizen, you know? And I'll put my credibility against any person in public office, not only across this state, but across this nation. I'm only going to say that folks ask the question all the time, and Mr. Fields has an answer for that question. So uh, it's up to the people to determine whether or not that is an answer they will accept or not accept. And uh, I am not going to say any other thing about it because it's in the, it's out there, and the issue was unindicted co-conspirator for the issue. So I'm not going to say anything else about it. He has an answer for it, and it's up to the people to determine whether or not they accept that answer. Thank you. And essentially it says, sir, that any time the state wants to sue an oil and gas or petrochemical industry, anyway, in connection with a violation of a law, rule, or order pertaining to the production, transportation, or marketing of those things, it must have been brought within three years from the time it was quote, made known to the Attorney General. And that's all it says. It's been on the books for 80 something years, and there's not been a reported decision dealt with it. But there are a few people that have dealt with it and can tell you that it has costed this state billions of dollars. Would you be in favor of looking at it to examine an appropriate amendment? Or an outright repeal of that lawsuit. Could you try to repeat? Yeah, I, 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 I will answer the question. Uh, but let me let me first say that you know, yeah, you know, I, I have tough skin and I, I I take a lot of attacks. You know, people can always see the speck in another person's eyes, but they can't see the log in their own. You know, but I don't like people making comments uh, 
that's offensive to me and my family, my two kids, my wife, that are not true. So, you know, and some people feel they know more about uh, the case than I do, but the truth of the matter, I wish somebody would show me some document that says that I'm some kind of co-conspirator, and I just hope that people stop saying that unless they have facts on that. Now, to answer your question, I will work with you, Ike, to, to deal with that. Uh, th you're talking about a prescriptive period is what you're talking about, three years. Um, we can sit down after you know this race is over with and we can determine whether or not three years is enough or three years is not enough uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and debate it and see if we can get some legislation that would be more uh, suitable. At the end of the day, I'm one who's going to protect the interests of property owners in this state. You know, we fight battles over land and we have to always prote protect the interests of property owners. I, I'm not an attorney. And you sound like somebody when I go to the prisons and I talk to the prisoners and said, how about t changing this law? You know, how about looking at my case when you uh, go back to the legislature? I think it's important that when you bring things up like that it, you, to have a very uh, in-depth dialogue on what's been the issues in the law. And in order to change the law, you really have to bring the resources and the re research together and have people at the table to determine whether or not it is beneficial to change it, an amendment, or to do away with it altogether. It's just like I tried to do away with the sodomy law. They wouldn't let me do that either. I, I want to know what the uh, current situation is on Medicaid. There have been several attempts to, I guess, go after allegedly uh, fraudulent uh, recipients. It's been brought up in the legislature a couple of times in the last two years. So uh, I just wonder if they what your uh, take is on this situation, and will there be more legislation to address it? I, I don't, you, I don't, sorry, could you repeat the question? Well, I guess your question, Mr. Hayatawi, is what legislation and what attempts will be made in the future on uh, Medicaid abuse? Yes. Um, uh, I don't know what legislation is pending, quite frankly. I'm not there. But uh, I do think we have to respect uh, the integrity of our Medicaid system. And we have to make absolutely certain that it's not abused uh, by by providers or anyone else, quite frankly. And uh, and I, you know, I'm steadfast on that. I just don't think people ought to abuse such uh, uh, government's uh, programs, uh, be it Medicaid or any other program. And I will work hard to make sure that uh, there is there is a little to no abuse. Medicaid expansion has been a hot topic, you know, for the past couple of years, and even since the governor uh, made the executive order to in initiate it. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that statistics have shown that the only, the, the more uh, fraud that happens in Medicaid expansion is from providers, not individuals. And what happened is a lot of our a lot of my colleagues began to look at individuals, uh, and those individuals, based on income, uh, were put on Medicaid by providers. And so they were coming, trying to come up with another mechanism of how to determine whether that income was correct or not. I think we always need to do an investigative report on us, ourselves, evaluate ourselves on whether or not we're doing the right thing. And because, but to know that there are over five, almost 500,000 people on Medicaid today with health insurance, and there are issues right now going on trying to eliminate some folks with pre-existing condition with the lawsuit going on, I think it's important that we recognize people in Louisiana have gotten health care and really need to continue having it. Representative Smith, I, I want to know your reaction to finding out that Cleo was going to run in this race. And then my question for Cleo is, you talked about your support for Representative Smith in the past. Why ultimately did you decide to get back into politics and challenge? That's an interesting question because, um, you know, I ran against Mr. Fields in 2003. And, um, of course, he didn't speak to me for four years. I don't know if he remembers that uh, after that. <laughs> but but uh, definitely when, uh, I, when I ran, uh, when he was uh, not able to run again, yes, I did seek his uh, support, and he supported me for those years that I ran. Well, when he called and said he wanted to meet, we met. Uh, I had a meeting with him at Highland Coffee, and he told me he was going to run, and uh, we had that conversation. And I sent him a text back, and I said, you know, there's an open seat in the house. 
wouldn't you like to run for the house? So we had two people. He never answered me. <laughs> I didn't answer probably because I don't run for office just to run for office. I run for office to serve the people and the good of the state. Um, I, I, you know, it took a lot for me to, to run uh, for District 14. Um, there were people who wanted me to run, you know, four years ago, six years ago, uh, eight years ago, but I chose not to. And I chose not to because I did not want to run against an incumbent. I didn't want to take a seat from anybody. Uh, but I did decide that I was going to run once the seat was vacant. Now, let's be clear, and I, you know, I, I try to run a very clean campaign, don't like to criticize anybody, no matter how many attacks that come, come my way. Uh, but District 14 has not had a senator for, for, for 12 years, and that's wrong. And I am running because we need a senator. You know, and, and this is not a game. You know, the people's lives are at risk here. And the only reason why I'm running, because we haven't had a senator. You got Southern University, for example. They need a senator there. You know, they have not had a single senator from that district for 12 years, and it's just wrong. Sort of in that same vein, um, there are groups of legislators who come together to support poor leans, be they Republican or Democrat or whatever. Uh, the Acadiana delegation has a group. Baton Rouge always seems to be fragmented. So let, talk to me about how you're thinking about the capital region and how it might come together as a powerful force. That's a very good question, uh, Beth. And y you know, we have to have legislators who can work with other legislators. And, and I, quite frankly, I pride myself on that. I mean, if you look at the endorsements I have in this race, you know, uh, that's because I'm a coalition builder. I bring people together. You know, the, the problem we have in the state, we talk at each other too much and not talk to each other. Uh, so I'm looking forward to bringing all of the members of the Baton Rouge delegation together so that we can work for the better, uh, for the betterment of Baton Rouge. Uh, and we did that when I was in the legislature, quite frankly. We worked hard to do that. I spent a lot of hours in doing that. Uh, and I want to thank the Baton Rouge Chamber of Commerce, for example. They worked profusely to try to bring that Baton Rouge delegation together to, to talk about uh, issues that affect the Baton Rouge region. So yes, I will do that. Uh, I've done it in the past and will do it in the future. As a part of the Capitol Regional Delegation, we're the largest delegation that exists in the, uh, was in the House, well, in the state legislature. And the unfortunate part of not being able to come together is everybody was territorial. And when you talk about looking at even the capital area, there were only certain things that we could bring together to come to a conclusion on that we wanted to have happen. We did come together on the bridge, which was important. But when you come together as a capital region in the way that projects were chosen, it was we were kind of always uh, outnumbered for the Baton Rouge area because of other areas. And so the way the process happened, you voted on them. And our votes didn't really count in many instances. We had to fight for Southern University to be able to get some of the uh, things that they got in the capital region that the group would support. So it really is important that we come together and understand that everybody counts. Everybody matters in that delegation. And we can't just be one-sided on how we actually do projects for the, for the state of Louisiana or even for the region. Thank you. I'm going to ask that each candidate now give a one minute closing statement. Since Ms. Smith opened up, we'll ask Mr. Fields to be first at this time. And then that will leave you guys with about five minutes before the one o'clock bell tolls in case you need to grab them for an extra question. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to just thank each of you of the Baton Rouge Press Club for having having this uh, forum. Uh, it's very simple for me. I want to go back to the legislature to finish the work that I've started. Uh, District 14 has been without a senator for 12 years. That's wrong to the people of the 14th district, and I want to fix that. I want to fix education. It's a serious problem in this state. Uh, I have a very strong track record. The first thing we got to do is pay teachers for the work that they do. You know, and you know, I'll often say we got to treat education just like we treat 
you know, our sports team. You know, you hire a person, you pay, you hire a coach, you pay them for the work they do, and then you expect results. Why don't we do have the same approach in education? Let's hire good teachers and good principals and good superintendents, and let's pay them for the work they do, and then let's have some, let's have some benchmarks. And we expect these kids to succeed. And that's all I want to do. I want to improve education. I want to fix this traffic problem. I mean, this traffic problem. And you know, I've been talking about, I don't have one minute, but let me just, I've been talking about this bridge problem since I got there, you know? And it has to be fixed, you know? I put $3 million in the budget to study this problem, and it appears that all they did was study the problem. Now it's time to fix the problem. Well, District 67 did have a representative and a representative that worked hard for the people that I represented. And that's why, since I've been that representative for District 67, which included LSU, it's now expanded to include uh, Southern University and other areas in District 14. I want to continue the work that I've done and the good work I've done for the people of District 67 and carry it over to the added precincts and added people in District 14. I have been there working hard. I've been a champion for many, many social issues as well as other issues in the state rep in the state house. I want to also make sure that we get minimum wage. I want to make sure we get equal pay. I want those things that I know are going to affect the people that we in the state of Louisiana really need to have happen. I want to keep Medicaid expansion, but I do want to see zero to three and pre-K and K-12 education and beyond be accessible to all children and to have quality education for all. And that's what I've been working on and want to continue working on since I've been there. Thank you.